Well, Leviticus, 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 chapter 16. And it is Yom Kippur in the Hebrew, which means the Day of Atonement. But people sometimes who read through this chapter go, it never says Day of Atonement. It actually describes this day without saying the actual name of this day. However, it talks more about this day in chapter 23. So in Leviticus 23, he's going to talk about it again. And in there, that case, when he's talking about Yom Kippur, he calls it the Day of Atonement. So we can call it the Day of Atonement. It just happens to not be in this chapter, that actual wordage. But understand that to the Jew, it is the most solemn the most significant in Jewish tradition, the most holy of days. It often isn't called Yom Kippur. It's just called Yom, the day. They know, the day. The day, what day? The Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. It's the day. And... Uh, we're going to discover in, uh, later on that it's on the 10th day of the seventh month, which happens to be just a couple weeks here in October. Um, I think it's October 15th or something. I have to relook at it, but it's coming right up really quick. So it says here, starting off in reference, uh, knowing that this is the one day out of the year that the high priest keeps to, gets to enter into the Holy of Holies, he wants to start off with a caution. And it comes up because when they started the opening day, a few days earlier, or months, I don't know when it started, but uh, remember, Nadab and Abihu were killed. So the inference here is that Nadab and Abihu didn't just offer an incense, a strange offering that God didn't require, but they had entered into the Holy of Holies. And this is part of the reason that they were killed. So it says in verse one, now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of two sons of Aaron. And when they offered profane fire before the Lord and died, and the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the seed. So again, um, he tells him th that nobody just can't go in there. And, and he's going to say, now I'm going to tell you the one time you can go in there. And that happens to be on the Day of Atonement. Now, some people wrongly say that the high priest only goes in one time a year, but actually he goes in twice, as we'll see in this chapter, once for himself and then another time for the people. But he actually enters the Holy of Holy twice, but yes, on this one day. And of course, you know, we have this picture, you know, the smoke and the mercy seat. This is the focus point is the mercy seat. And it's the two cherubim standing on each side of an empty space, but it's where the invisible God dwells, seats himself. It's the throne of God in heaven. But there they don't have statues of angels. They have the real angels, the sheriff and the servant flying around saying, holy, holy, holy. But remember when Christ was in the tomb, if you look at all the gospels, there was actually two angels on each side that talked to the people. So one of the gospels has one angel, but if you look, there's actually one gospel that has two angels. And they're there <laughs> at the tomb, if you would, in this empty space, but it is where Jesus rose again in glory, but uh, now he is no longer there. He is risen. 
So in the New Testament, Jesus' death and resurrection, we remember when he was on the cross, he cried out with a loud voice and yelled up with his spirit. You know, we often forget that because he is breathless. He's hanging on the cross. He's losing his breath as he would collapse and, and try to strength to pull him back up. But this time, loud voice. And then he shouts, he yields up his spirit with this shout. And they happen to know. As we know in the other gospels, the earth shook and all of this, and it was all at the same time. And they know it because at that moment, the veil ripped in the temple from top to bottom, exposing the holy of holies. Now, again, by tradition, Jeremiah hid the Ark of the Covenant before uh, the Babylonians came and, and took everything away. And uh, that the Ark had never been recovered, never mentioned again. So possibly they were just staring into an empty room. Um, and, the, and the priests were, after Babylon, were just sort of, the high priest would go in there and just pretend there was a mercy seat, I guess. And just sprinkle it on the ground. And this is what we're going to get out of this chapter tonight. Is that this is the most significant day. But it really didn't have enough substance to do what it was supposed to do. It really was weak. It really spoke of, of a need for something more than this. That's what we walk away with. Especially as we get to the end and talk about the fact they can't do this. And they haven't been able to do this for almost the last 2,000 years. A matter of fact, they didn't do it but a few more times after Christ died and rose again. 70 AD, there was just a few more years, and Rome came down with Titus, and he destroyed Jerusalem. Jews were scattered and had, did not come back together as a nation until recently, in 1948. And... Um, we also know in, math, in Romans 5, 1 and 2, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So as they were afraid to die in the very presence of God, we have no such fear, do we? And I love that, of course, and Hebrews 4, when it, verse 14 and 16, when it talks about seeing we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And that's a point that Paul makes a lot through Hebrews, is that one of the requirements for the high priest is he was a sinner like everybody else. And he had to declare that. And he had to do something about it before he could then make atonement for the people. And that the Bible saying, God made it this way on purpose. So you had a compassionate high priest who was not, you know, looking down his nose. These stinking people, God, forgive them. And all. it's like, Lord, forgive us. I, you know, the biggest sinner I know is me. Um, you know, I'm the chief of all sinners. So God said that was an important aspect in God's point of view of the high priest. That So he would have not condemnation to the people, but in this day of atonement, have compassion. But then he points out that Jesus has great compassion because he went through more temptation than any man who was 33 years old because he wanted to experience the type of temptation. And, and this is significant. We're actually going to talk about it this Sunday morning in the sermon in, in 2 Timothy. But at all points, tempted as we are tempted, yet without sin. All points. So you say, well, I've got some pretty unique lust, you know, uh, I won't tell you because it might embarrass you, but my lust or this or that. I mean, there's a lot of weird fetishes out there, aren't there? And a lot of them are sinful. Um, but then people have a lot of fears, weird fears. Um, 
Irrational fears. There's, there's things in us that causes us to do things wrong because of those fears. And so no matter how bizarre, no matter how unique you might think your sin is, Jesus doesn't look down his nose at you in condemnation. He is a high priest who has great compassion. He's the high priest who has compassion. So we come boldly into the throne of grace. We are coming right to the throne. We're coming right to where the mercy seat and the Lord's sitting upon the mercy seat. We come boldly, not like Aaron, not like other high priests did. We come boldly in a throne because it's grace that we've received at that throne and we've attained mercy and we find grace to help us in our time of need. So we don't go once a year. We go daily, don't we? (laughs) Actually, we go several times a day. Well, in verse three through five now, um, with that warning laid out, he now calls Aaron to get prepared himself so he can uh, be a vessel that can be used. So verse three through five is about Aaron's preparation. So Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of the young bull as a sin offering and a ram as a burnt offering. So, so far, we're gonna end up with five animals at the end of this day. But so far, we have one bull and one ram. He shall put the holy linen tunic and the linen trousers on his body. He shall gird with the linen sash and with the linen turban. He shall be attired. There's a picture of it on the screen for you guys. And these are the holy garments. Therefore, he shall wash his body in water and put them on. The... Uh, Jewish tradition says that this washing in water wasn't from the laver. It was actually, he did a complete submersion uh, in water and washed himself thoroughly, probably in a river or something. And he shall take from the congregation, the children of Israel, two kids of the goats as a sin offering and one ram as a burnt offering. So there we go. One bull, two rams, two goats. Five in total. One ram for Aaron and his family, one ram for the people and their sins, and then two goats and the one bull also for Aaron's sinfulness. So he did not wear his beautiful priestly robes as it tells us in Exodus 28 to that they were made for glory and for beauty but he put on the simple trousers. Um, Very, um, just white, the ordinary, almost just the undergarments, if you would, of what the priest would wear. And he washed his whole body, mostly by full submersion. And then he had two goats and a one ram. And this came, these two goats came from the congregation. I love this. The goat that'll be sacrificed for the sins of the people comes from the midst of the congregation like Christ came from the midst of the congregation. And this will be a sin offering. And then there's the one for the congregate, for the the burnt offering, one for a sin offering, one for a burnt offering for consecration. Well, verse six through 10 now, we're gonna talk about the two goats. We're going to talk about him quite a bit through this chapter, but we're going to talk to him about him here. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself and makes atonement for himself and for his house. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle meeting. Verse eight, and Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's, not on the one, the one which the lots, <laughs> let me read it again, verse nine. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell. Don't say that three times fast. And offer it as a sin offering. 
But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. And so again, the first thing that was done once Aaron got bathed and once he got the various animals in place, the first thing was for his own sin. Hebrews 9, 7 says, But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he had offered for himself and for the people's sin committed in ignorance. So Aaron It says this 20 times, and Aaron shall, and he shall. Because this is a solo job. (laughs) Aaron, the high priest, is alone. He's doing it all. So normally the tabernacle is a busy place with lots of people and lots of sacrifices and, and people coming and people leaving and people in the midst. And there was a lot of activity. But this day was a day of rest, we'll find out. It's a Sabbath. Nobody's to be working. Everybody can come and check it out. But all they'll see is one person doing everything. People come, they bring the two goats uh, from the midst, but Aaron shall, he shall, 20 times in this chapter, it points out that he alone is doing all of this work. In Hebrews 7, verse 26 to 28, it says, for such a high priest was fitting for us. This is in contrast to the Old Testament high priest, in contrast, in Jesus, our high priest, for such a high priest, Jesus was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become a higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priest men who have weaknesses. But the word of the oath, which came from the law, appoints the son who has been perfected for other. So God made it so the person that would be doing this would himself have weaknesses and have compassion. It talks about it more than once in Hebrews. But with Christ, he was perfect for us. Now, I just want to ask you a question. Was there ever a point in time where Christ did have sin? Absolutely. He who knew no sin, what? Became sin. Hebrews points out the soul that sins shall surely die. But Jesus never sinned. But he died. You realize, hypothetically, Jesus could have hung on that cross forever. (laughs) But he died. Why? Because our sins were placed upon him. And our sins put him to death. So our holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, high priest... He offered up himself, it says here, as the sacrifice once for all. So he is the one giving the sacrifice. He is the one doing the sacrifice. And he is the sacrifice. And he has conquered all sin. None of it is, (laughs) but all sin when he himself became sin for us. Remember, Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son be lifted up. Now, you, you, we know that story, right? Where the snakes were biting them and, and God said, get one of the poles, a flag poles. They all had flags for their tribes. Get a pole and, and, and make a bronze servant, bronze the medal of judgment, and put the serpent, and then whoever looks shall... Yeah, serpent, okay, hold on. Serpent is not a good thing. Why? What about an eagle or a dove or, you know, uh, some kind of emblem of, of fire or holiness or something? 
but a snake, and they're getting healed by looking at the snake. It just doesn't sit right with me. And then when Jesus says, just like they looked at the snake on the pole, so you look at the snake on the pole. And whoever believes shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's in verse 15, John 3, 15, right before 16. And you say, well, I don't like that. Jesus, you're, you're calling yourself a snake. Yes. He who knew no sin became sin, the snake. We got to understand this. It's he who was rich became poor that we might become rich. And I don't think we can ever fully appreciate what Christ did till we understand he was harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. But sin came upon him, the sin of the whole world. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It was a huge moment in time. But this son who has been appointed has perfected forever. Well, these two goats, they were very much, according to the Jewish tradition, were they, they tried to get twins. They tried to get two goats about the same size, look similar, same color, same value, exactly. And, and then they said, one is for the Lord and the other is for the, uh, the Azael, A-Z-A-Z-E-L, Azael. That Hebrew word is, is debated on what it exactly means, but for us, the way we translate and understand it is the scapegoat, the one that, that gets away. Now, there's a couple of different theories on how the lots system worked. Some say that one of the pieces of wood or whatever it was had the name of the Lord on it. Yah, Y-H-W-H. And then the other one had the Hasiel on it, the name, that, uh, two actual words. So they put them together and then they just put them on the goats, and that was which is which. There's another one that says, no, they, it was, they might have used like the humum and the thermum. Had a black, maybe white rock. One was yes, one was no, or one was live, one was die. But that was the idea, is that one would say yes, and the other would say no. And so these are the various ideas we don't know practically, and, and we often ask these questions, what did exactly they do? Because remember, in the upper room, they chose lots, which of the two guys would be the apostle, um, which is interesting. Well, in Leviticus 16, verse 11 and 14, and Aaron shall bring the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bull as the sin offering, which is for himself. Then he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire, from the altar before the Lord, this is the incense, the table of incense, okay? Which is hands full of sweet incense, beaten fine, and brings it inside the veil. And he shall put the incense of the fire before the Lord, and the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, lest he die. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with the finger of the mercy seat um, on east side before the mercy seat. He shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. So, this is interesting on a few things. So it sounds like he enters the Holy of Holies maybe a few times. He goes in with the incense. It's full. It's not just a little bit of that they normally have and a little bit of, you know, the sweet smell in the area. No, this time it's so much when he takes it into that 15 by 15 size room, very small, you know, what a quarter of the stage up here that the smoke fills and you can't he can't really see much because of the smoke but again this is a perfective measure that he doesn't die and of course when we get a picture of heaven we know that the shekinah glory of god indeed 
is very much like that. So this is what it's represented. But at the same time, he's got blood. So it sounds like his hands are full with incense. But then he also goes back in with the blood. And it says on the east side. So many think because of this, and if you know how it's set, it's facing east. And so he would go in and on the east side of it, remember the, it, the whole thing was set east, he would then sprinkle it east. Now, why is this important? Because the scapegoat is going to be released. And some believe that this is what David was referring to in Psalms 103 when he said, our sins are scattered from the east to the west, or to be remembered no more, to be go out into the wilderness and be gone. He was actually referring to this picture of the Day of Atonement. So the historical prayer, Rucker says, the priest would say something like this, the high priest. According to the tradition, he prayed the following prayer. O God, I have committed iniquity, transgression, and sin before thee. I and my house, O God, forgive the iniquities and the transgressions and sins which I have committed and transgressions and sin before thee. I and my house, as it is written in the law thy of thy servant Moses. And again, the points of contrast are here. So Aaron and every priest descended from him was a sinner and had to get take care of his own sin first. But not so with our Messiah, Jesus Christ, as we just looked at, who does not need daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and for the priest. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Hebrews 4.15, that was Hebrews 4.7 again, verse 27. Verse, uh, Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have a high priest who could not sympathize with our weakness, but was at all points tempted as we are, makes it very clear here, yet without sin. All of this, Colossians 2.17 tells us, is a shadow of the things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So this day of atonement is really a picture of Christ. And this is what we see. I love that passage in Acts 8, where the, the Ethiopian eunuch was going along and Philip got translated, and he, he's, he's, but he's there and, and he says, to the eunuch, as he sees him reading the scriptures, you know, hey, what are you reading? And it says, he took him from that scripture and preached Christ. And that is uh, Billy Graham. One of the things that he taught in his discipleship is every page of the Bible speaks of Christ. And we saw that with the lepers and the, the cleansing of the leprosy and now we're seeing this with the Day of Atonement, well, as well as all the different sacrifices. And so um, the blood of the bull would be on the mercy seat. That is the lid of the ark. It, again, it would appear in a cloud above the mercy seat. What is in the mercy seat? It's interesting when you look at it, when you think about it. Inside the mercy seat is all signs of a sinful man. Remember the three things that were in there? The manna was in there. Why was the manna even existence? Because he put it in there when they were complaining about not having meat, but only that stinking manna. Remember? And then the tablets of the law, and Israel broke the law. And then the budding almond, we're going to see that in number 16 with Aaron, when his, the whole people revolt against Aaron and Moses' leadership. And, and God said, he'll choose which one. And Aaron puts his rod forth, and it's a cordial old piece of wood, but it buds and, and it even has almonds on it. Speaking of Israel's rebellion. And then he does it seven times. Jesus was pierced on the cross seven times. On the cross, he had seven saints, all picturing the work 
of Christ and the, his blood that would be put upon the mercy seat, not the one on earth, uh, this replica of heaven, but the actual one in heaven. And then it also says, not only on the mercy seat, but then he says, before the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some more blood, and say seven times. But on the mercy seat, before the mercy seat, all around the mercy seat, there was blood. And in verse 15 to 19 there, then he shall kill the goat for the sin offering and what is for the people, bring its blood inside the veil. So with the blood, as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgression for their sin. So it shall do for the tabernacle of meeting which remains among them in the midst of their unclean cleanness. There shall be no man in the tabernacle of meeting when he goes in and makes atonement in the holy place until he comes out, that he may make atonement for himself and for his household and then for all the assembly of Israel. Verse 18, he shall go out of the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it onto the horns of the altar all around. Then he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it on his fingers seven times and cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And so this goat, like Jesus, was spotless. It was the one chosen from amongst the people as Christ was chosen. And then the blood would be taken into the holy place, not just this earthly replica of man upon dirt, but actually the blood of this sacrifice would be taken by the high priest into the actual heavenly. In Hebrews 9, 12, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, obtaining eternal redemption. Two goats, but one sacrifice. Do we understand that? It's referred to one sacrifice. Two goats are brought, but it's called one sacrifice. And this is an important point because the one speaks of divine and the human nature of Christ, and the other one speaks of his death and resurrection. Historically, this was the only time, according to the Jewish tradition, that the high priest could actually say the name of God, and only once. Why did he have to consecrate the holy place, the tabernacle and everything, the altar, and everything had to get... Because the people, it tells us, because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Their constant presence has made the place unclean. Isn't that interesting? They're coming to seek God, but their flesh still contaminates the place. They come to give their offerings for their sins, but their flesh is still sinful and contaminates the place. So on this one day a year, when the time begins over again, it's purified. The mercy seat, blood is before the mercy seat. Blood is put uh, again before the tabernacle and blood is put before the altar. All of these uncontaminated by the contamination of our sinful nature. Three words are constantly used in this chapter when it talks about the sin of the priest and the sin of the people. Their transgressions, their sins, and their uncleanness. Have you caught that? Each time he says transgressions, sins, and uncleanness. All of these terms speak of an extreme emphasis to the idea of Israel's sinfulness. This was atonement for the depths of sin, especially this word transgression. 
The word transgression here is speaking of the most grievous word for sin in the Old Testament. It indicates a breach of relationship between two parties. And so he is saying your sinful condition has has contaminated this place, has broken the fellowship. But yet now it's being redone by this sacrifice. This one man does on behalf of all the people. Now in verse six, chapter 16, verse 20 and 22, 22, 22. And when he was, has made an end of atoning of the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel, all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. This is the only time in this chapter somebody other than Aaron gets to do something. And we don't know who this guy, it's a suitable man. It almost makes it sound like it's not one of the priests. It's somebody chosen other than the priest because he's not going to be in the area he's leaving. And the goat shall bear on itself all the iniquity to an uninhabited land, and he shall release the goat into the wilderness. So the high priest... um, after he has dealt with his own sin, after he has washed and cleansed all things in the tabernacle, now, and then done the the sacrifice for the sins of all the people, now he can transfer the sins onto this live goat to be transferred over to them and then released. So you see, they don't have the ability to kill the goat, use its blood on the altar, and then raise it from the dead, (laughs) and then send it on its way. That would be a perfect analogy, right? That would be a much better analogy. But instead, they took two identical goats. And it's as if they were one, because it talks about the two goats being one sacrifice. And so together they give the one picture. In one case, the punishment for sins is on this innocent animal and the sins are transferred over and the people's sins are punished in the place of the death of that sacrifice. But then their sins again are transferred on the same goat, so to speak, but this time it's gone into the wilderness, gone, never has to see or hear or have anything to do with it again, as if God has taken it and buried it in the deepest sea. God has taken it, scattered it as far as the east is to the west to be remembered no more. Again, a prayer in the Mishnah that the high priest would pray would, for the people would go something like this. O God, thy people, the house of Israel, have committed iniquities, transgressions, and sins before thee. O God, forgive, I pray, the iniquities and the transgressions and the sins which thy people, the house of Israel, have committed, and the transgression and transgressed and sinned before thee, as it is written in the law of, of thy servant Moses. So this one guy gets to come in and be the suitable guy, and all he does is hold on to the goat, Aaron puts his hands on it, and then he walks it out and releases it into the wilderness. Spurgeon, in his commentator, points out that it was actually about 10 miles out of Jerusalem. And that what they did is they had several refreshment stations, he called them, along the way that they would stop um, about, I guess, a mile or two out every so often, and people would be there observing this goat. And then, um, finally, at the 10-mile mark, they would stand there, and they would watch the goat wander into the wilderness until he could see it no more and the sin was gone and then they would come back and tell the people it was gone and it was complete. Day of atonement is complete. And so again, 
the question would come up by the people, where are our sins put away? Were our sins put away completely? How could one know for certain that God had accepted the sacrifice of the Day of Atonement? What if someone accidentally encountered the scapegoat in the wilderness? What if the scapegoat wandered back amongst the people of Israel, maybe back into Jerusalem? Historically, they put a scarlet uh, ribbon onto this goat. So Israelis would know, people would know, oh, don't touch that, that's... That's the goat that, that, that nobody's supposed to know where it's going. Leave it alone. But they also taught that the observers along the stations, part of the reason they were there, to see if the red scarlet ribbon had turned white. Because if it turned white, then they could tell the people that God accepted their sin by this turning white. However, as time went on, you know, when they came back from Babylon, Judaism was really not Judaism anymore, right? We know that, right? The time, you look at the Judaism, the time of Christ, um, Jesus just said it's sinful. It's of, of the devil. It's evil. And, and so what happened eventually is the whole priesthood was corrupt. And so they weren't, because the population continued to grow, and, and they They really wanted the people to believe in the system. So they now had this guy, instead of taking him 10 miles out, the guy would take it to the cliff and throw it off the cliff and kill it. But again, he would come back with the report that it turned white. Interesting. This is in the documentation of the Jewish history that about a 40 years before the destruction of the temple, do the math, this is at the time of Christ. It's actually a little before his death on the cross. They came back with the report that the, that the, white, that the red ribbon did not turn white. And there's a long thing on this. They go into bemoaning and weeping and, and talking about how it's, it's broken. The system's broken. It's not working anymore. And this was front page news amongst the Jews. The time Christ was there preaching. These are things they wouldn't get. Now there's a story in the Gospels that often people wonder, why is the story there? And do you remember this is when Pilate gets this idea after talking to Jesus, going, I don't see any sin in this guy. I don't know what's going on. Why why are they so upset? He seems like a great guy. And then he realized it's because the people are envious of Jesus. The other leaders are envious of Jesus. So in Matthew 27, verse 15 to 26, he he goes out to the people and he says, I'm going to give you a choice. Somebody's going to go free tomorrow. And the choice is going to be between Barabbas. This guy was hated. He was a terrorist. Nobody wanted this guy in their community. They wanted him dead. Or this guy, Jesus Christ. Perfect. There's no sin whatsoever in this guy. But yet the Pharisees were in the midst of the crowd and, and they said, say Barabbas. And they started screaming, Barabbas, Barabbas. And, and Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with this Jesus Christ? Why? What evil has he done? And they screamed out, crucify him. And then they said, let the blood of this man be on us and our children, but release Barabbas. Interesting, isn't it? A picture there of Christ um, being the lamb chosen from amongst the people, or the goat chosen amongst the people. Well, in verse 23 to 28, he now was to take off his outer robe, him and also the guy that went with the goat, the two of them, they were to both wash um, they're, they're, and put on new clothes. And of course, now the high priest would put on his priestly garment. 
And again, we see this picture of the high priest. He is humble, putting on just these underclothes, these simple white linen garments. He was spotless um, because he himself made atonement for himself and for his house. He was alone. He had to do all of this alone. Nobody else could be there. And then he made intercession for the people. Remember in verse 12, he took the censer full of burnt coals and the fire from the altar before the Lord. His hands were full of the sweet incense, beaten and fine, and he brings it inside the veil. Remember in Revelation 5.8, it talks about our prayers And it says, the golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Revelation 8, 3 and 4, the same thing. The prayers of the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. The smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God. We find the same with Jesus. His glorious, beautiful garments were taken off. They stripped him. At one point, they put on a scarlet robe and put uh, something in his hand and put thorns, a crown upon him, and they bowed and worshiped, and then they were just mocking him, and then they started smacking him and spitting on him, and then they put his clothes back on him. But then, when we get to the cross, we realize they took his clothes off and didn't give him new clothes. He was naked. And his clothes were valuable. It tells us in John that that this was a one-piece tunic without seam. And they were going to rip it in parts and I'll take a part of it. And they said, no, it's too valuable. Let's cast lots, fulfilling the scriptures that they they cast lots for my clothes. Jesus was spotless. 1 Peter 1.19 says, But the precious blood of Christ is a lamb without blemish and without spot. And then Jesus did all of this alone. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, he went, left all the apostles, took three of them with him, and then he went further without them. And he was, his soul was exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. And he cried out, and the blood vessels began to break, and sweat and blood dropped to the ground. And then it spoke of these guys telling him, you guys are going to leave me, and leave me alone. And just like the scripture said in Zechariah, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. Of course, they said, no, it won't, but yeah, they did. And then Jesus put away the sins of the people. Hebrews 9, 26, again. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Amen? Revelation 1.5, the end of that verse says, He loved us and washed us from our sins in his what? Own blood. 2 Corinthians 5.21 again, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of Christ. And then Isaiah 53, I love that. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. For the transgressions of the people, he was stricken. And then now he is there before giving intercession forever in heaven. In Hebrews 7.25, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Romans 8, 34, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercessions for us. Well, then in, in verse 29 to 32, it says, hey, this is a day to afflict your soul, what they interpreted as fasting. It doesn't say fasting here, but yet with all the Jewish writings, they saw thought it said fasting. The point was, is that they were to have a day of humility and of repentance, understanding what it took that they would be forgiven. They needed to afflict their soul looking and thinking about this innocent little animal dying and being sacrificed for their sin and having sympathy afflicting for that victim in their place. In the New Testament, in the same way that we are to identify, afflict our souls 
with repentance and humility and to see ourselves in that sacrifice, that innocent lamb of God in our case, in our place. In Galatians 2.20, Paul says, for I have been what? Crucified with Christ. In Romans 6, he goes through an elaborate explaining, going, hey, you guys should see yourself having died with Christ. That's what we're doing in baptism. You're dying with Christ. You should see yourself on that cross. And then you should also see yourself with Christ when he rose from the dead. You were in him when he rose from the dead as well. So afflict our soul. You know, in Judaism, this is the only time that they, in the Mosaic law, they were called to fast. Interesting. So typically they fast. They also, in the Mishnah said, you also need to cut out bathing, using oil on the body, wearing shoes, and sexual intercourse. Even if a Jewish person today, present time, observed all the things on Yom Kippur, afflicting their soul, they still have no sacrifice for sins. Do you understand this is a worthless chapter? This is a throwaway chapter. They have no high priest. (laughs) They have no temple. They have no anything. Now they can remake it, but how are they going to have truly for certain somebody from the tribe of Aaron? Now they think through DNA they've solved many of these problems. So what do they do in place of this? What are they doing? Think about this. It was from Moses giving the law to Jesus Christ with 1,500 years. From Jesus Christ to today, about 2,000 years, right? Not quite, but close. It's been longer The Jews have been longer without the temple and the priesthood. Longer than with it. And even if you look at it, they had times they didn't have it even during that 1,500 years because of their sinfulness. So today, some of the Jews, they actually do their own sacrifices. They do a hen for a sacrifice. Its blood is for the men. A uh, rooster, excuse me, for the men, and then you do a hen for the women. It's a very vague <laughs> way of celebrating that day. Most Jews consider their charity. So before the day of Yom Kippur comes up, they try to wait. They try to they focus on what have I done that was selfish and wrong and sinful, and so then they try to balance the scales by spending those few weeks before atonement to chastise themselves. And, and, and sacrifice themselves in charitable deeds. In the Eastern European Jews, they actually afflicted themselves with 39 sla- lashes on themselves. And some Jew- Jews today consider good works and the study of the Torah as their affliction, their sacrifice, instead of a high priest sacrificing on their behalf. And then in verse 32 to 34 is just a summary ending on this particular chapter. If you could, I didn't get it into your notes, but turn over to Hebrews 9 is the last verse we're going to look at. And look once again at verses 24 to 28. We've looked at part of it, but I want you to think about this. Hebrews 9, verse 24 to 28. Then we got a video for you real quick. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, not an empty spot between two cherubim on the mercy seat, but actually before God himself. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place, every year with the blood of another, he then would have to have suffered often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the age, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this judgment. So Christ also offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin, for salvation. Now, 
I want to answer one question that I know is going to come up at our question and answer time, and I'd like to get it on so everybody can hear it. The question is, I'm confused. (laughs) Was Jesus the Passover lamb, or was he the Day of Atonement goat? Which one is it? And I have no idea how to answer that. That was all I was going to say. No, no. It's really both. But when you think about it, God in his foreknowledge knew that the Day of Atonement would eventually end. Right? But Jews to this day have Passover. Passover can be done without a temple, without a priesthood. But also... Maybe it's because John the Baptist sort of blew it, you know. When he saw Jesus, he didn't say, Behold the goat of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the two goats of God who take away the sin of the world. But he said the Lamb of God, so then Jesus said, Hey, we've got to scrap the Day of Atonement thing and go with Passover. John messed it up here. Um, <laughs> but again, in the Passover, the blood was applied by them to the door. Right? It wasn't a priesthood. They applied the blood of the lamb themselves by faith on the door with the hyssop branch. And and those who did it, no death came to them. They did not perish. But those who thought it was silly or didn't believe it was real, thought it was some hocus pocus, they didn't do it. And the firstborn child died. Remember? Remember? And so again, in Christ, the Lamb of God, we eat of him. We take his blood ourselves by faith and we apply the blood to the door. He is the door. We're the door. Open the door of our heart and have Jesus come in. He is the door that we enter by. And so also in the Day of Atonement, again, as we looked at this Day of Atonement, there's just a lot of weak spots in it, right? You, you, you have to make sure the high priest, hopefully he's sincere, which we looked at the Old Testament. There was a lot of bad high priest. Weren't sincere high priest. Boy, read the major prophets. They were very unhappy with the priesthood. Um, and then, of course, God eventually says at the end of the Old Testament, Malachi, he says, don't bring any more sacrifices. I don't want them. I don't receive them. There's no faith in it. There's no humility in it. There's no repentance in it. I, I haven't wanted anything. But again, he didn't say that about the Passover. So the Passover is something that was continuous. And, um, and that was, and, and to be honest with you, I think it sounds better. Behold the lamb of God rather than behold the goat of God. Just say, just say, just say. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Jesus Jesus is the goat, the greatest of all times. That's a good one. And it's good to have you back. We've missed you the last few weeks. I have a video for you that it's going to be about 10 minutes long. So sorry for we're going over a little bit late. But uh, then I'll answer. Your, we'll have a question and answer time after that. The Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, is the most holy and solemn day of the Jewish calendar. It is the only day when the High Priest could enter the Holy of Holies, the most sacred place within the tabernacle and ancient temples. It was the only day when the High Priest reconciled Israel with God and symbolically brought them back into the presence of the Lord. No other day and no other ancient ritual comes closer to the full meaning and purpose of the atonement of Jesus Christ. The fall season of festivals begins with Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the Jewish New Year. Rosh Hashanah marks the start of a 10-day period of repentance and preparation for the Day of Atonement. During these 10 days, Israelites would seek to draw closer to God in preparation for these sacred rituals. On the Day of Atonement, all of Israel would be forgiven for their sins of the previous year, thus allowing them to be cleansed and prepared for the Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkot, to occur five days later. 
Feast of Tabernacles was the final and most joyous of the three major Jewish feasts of Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. The Day of Atonement followed a complex yet beautiful ritual symbolizing that all of Israel now had been forgiven and was able to re-enter the presence of the Lord through the High Priest. The ritual began with the High Priest, dressed in his normal colorful golden garments, offering the daily morning ritual of sacrifices and burning of incense on the altar of incense. He then would wash his flesh and change into simple white robes. The act of washing and changing clothes would actually occur five separate times throughout the ritual. The wearing of just the white robes could symbolize the Savior, who leaving his heavenly throne, laid aside all the glory and put upon himself the plain robe of humanity, becoming like one of us. The color of white is also a powerful symbol of purity, representing the absolute purity of the true great high priest, even Jesus Christ. Next, the high priest would bring two goats into the tabernacle or temple and cast lots for each of them. One lot was for Azael, or the scapegoat, and the other was for the Lord. A red ribbon was tied around the horns of the scapegoat to distinguish it from the other goat. The high priest would then take a bullock, or young bull, and place his hands on its head, symbolically transferring his own sins and the sins of his fellow priests to the bull. He would then slit the throat of the bull and catch the blood in a dish to be saved for later services. He then would bring a burning coal from the altar of sacrifice and incense into the Holy of Holies through the veil for the first time. Here dressed in all white, the high priest would burn the incense before the Lord. The room would fill with smoke, the cloud of smoke often being a symbol of the presence of God. The high priest then would exit the Holy of Holies, wash again, and take the blood of the bull and re-enter the Holy of Holies for a second time. He would then sprinkle seven times the blood of the bull on the Ark of the Covenant. The shedding of the blood of the young bull represented that the high priest was forgiven and reconciled to enter into the presence of the Lord. The high priest would then kill the goat that was chosen for the Lord, again saving the blood in a dish. He then would enter the Holy of Holies with this blood for the third and final time. As he did before, he would sprinkle the blood of the goat seven times before the ark. As the goat was the offering for the people, this act of bringing its blood into the Holy of Holies represented that all of Israel was symbolically able to enter the presence of the Lord through the high priest and because of the shedding of the blood of the sacrifice. Just as the high priest could only enter by blood, so too it is only by the shed blood of Jesus Christ that we can enter God's presence. As the high priest exited the Holy of Holies, he would then sprinkle the combined blood of the bull and the goat before the veil of the tabernacle. He would also use the blood to cover the four horns of the altar of incense. The remaining blood would be poured out at the base of the altar of sacrifice in the outer court. The high priest would then return to the scapegoat and place his hands upon its head, symbolically transferring the sins of all of the people to the goat. He then would utter the sacred name of the Lord, which was never to be said except on this holy day. O Jehovah, I entreat thee, your people the house of Israel, has been iniquitous, sinned and erred before you. O then Jehovah, cover over, I entreat thee, upon their iniquities, their transgressions and their sins. The goat was then taken outside of the tabernacle and led into the wilderness. The guiltless goat, dependent upon its owner for its care and protection, would become lost and die in the desert. Perhaps no symbol of the Savior is more powerful than the scapegoat. Innocent of any wrongdoing, just like this goat, the Savior has had laid upon him the sins of the world. As Isaiah so beautifully stated, 
All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Modern readers often gloss over the significance of the Day of Atonement as simply an outdated, archaic ritual of death and covering of blood. However, as one better understands each of the aspects, it teaches a powerful message of the atonement of Jesus Christ. The word atonement, or kafar in Hebrew, actually means to cover. Thus, as the high priest literally covers with blood the ark, the veil, and the altars of the tabernacle, he symbolically shows that atonement has been made and that the way is now open to progress back through the tabernacle because of the shedding of blood. From the scriptures, we learn that when the Savior went to pray and suffer in Gethsemane, he first left eight disciples at the entrance, then took Peter, James, and John further into the garden, and then by himself went further into pray. Though it is impossible to know the exact reason for this three-level progression the Savior creates within the garden, it has a strong correlation to the three levels of the tabernacle with the outer courtyard, the holy place, and the holy of holies. It is as if the Savior desired to recreate these three levels to show that he was officiating as our great high priest and interceding on our behalf. How beautifully the symbolism of the Day of Atonement teaches us that it is only through the shed blood of the Lamb of God, even Jesus Christ, that we can once again enter the presence of the Lord. It is only because He took upon Himself our sins and iniquities that we can be forgiven and our burdens made light. Because of Him, we can have our sins covered over, blotted out, or atoned for. The book of Hebrews teaches, But Christ, being come an high priest, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. How wonderful it is that unlike ancient Israel, who only could be forgiven once a year, we can daily come to the Lord, lay our sins and guilt upon him, and continually be forgiven and cleansed because of His atonement. So again, it, it, the covering, co you know, the question is covering for what, for how long, how good, how deep? And of course we know it was just a covering year by year waiting eventually for Christ who would not cover but actually take away our sin, right? And then in uh, 1 Corinthians 5, it says, Christ who is our Passover. It doesn't say Christ who is our, he is our atonement, but we, we see a far greater atonement, you know, not just the replica on earth where man, sinful man officiated, but the actual temple itself where Christ himself entered before God itself with real angels and with his own blood, um, not of just of an animal, you know, but his own blood. So all of this uh, is showing that the Day of Atonement shows that it's weak and it has to be something more than, than what's happening. And then, of course, the system breaks down, 70 years in Babylon and, um, and other times when they were conquered by other nations. Um, you know, and even after they returned to Babylon, you know, Nehemiah couldn't keep any priest around. They were all, uh, as soon as he left, going back to see to his duties in, um, in Iran with the, the Xerxes, then he had to come back and they, the whole thing was completely kaput and he had to start over. So anyway, a lot of interesting stuff. Questions? you have any questions?